Uh, hello, I'm Tyler Jones, and welcome uh, to uh, Psychedelic Assisted Therapies. For this panel discussion, um, as part of an exciting series called the Dana Discovery Dialogues, produced with support from the Dana Foundation. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be available later on the Dana Foundation's digital platforms. Uh, the Dana Discovery Dialogues dig into the most compelling and relevant subjects in neuroscience, highlighting how the latest research influence influences everything from our personal decisions to how we deal with society's broader challenges. Uh, with the recent legislation making psychedelic use and study more available, uh, there are still federal hoops to jump. In this conversation, we'll talk about how psychedelics can treat trauma, enhance empathy, and how federal stalls may leave the most in need groups behind. Uh, together, we'll learn about the neuroscience of psychedelic assisted therapies from this expert panel. A bit later in this session, we will be taking your questions. And when you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and then feel free to put them there anytime during our conversation. Um, our panelists today are Dr. Lindsay Cameron from Stanford University, uh, Dr. Jane C. Hu, uh, independent journalist, and Dr. Jennifer Mitchell from the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, to start off, I'd like each of the speakers to share a bit about themselves and how they're thinking about the topic of psychedelic assisted therapies. What animates your passion for this area? Uh, Jane, let's start with you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Jane Hu. Um, like Tyler said, I'm an independent journalist, um, and psychedelics is one of many things that I cover, but I first got onto this beat a couple years ago, and I just immediately got drawn in by how it really touches on everything. Um, I know that here we're going to be talking a lot about psychedelics and research specifically. Um, and, you know, when I first started scratching the surface of what psychedelics mean, um, I think, of course, we gravitate towards just what are these drugs and what do they do? But as I dug deeper, I realized that it really touches on just so many different areas of society, um, not only science and research, but also how our medical system works, um, how our legal system works, and how we regulate drugs um, and the process of doing that. And also things like spirituality and religion and general belief um, in, a, in a deep way that I just wasn't completely expecting. And I feel like as time goes on, it touches more and more parts of society. And um, I'm just really excited to dig in and get to talk about some of that today. Um, and then next we'll go to Lindsay. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Lindsay Cameron. Um, just a bit of background about myself. I uh, did my undergrad studying drug design and development with a heavy emphasis in, in chemistry. I did uh, my uh, PhD in neuroscience with the intention of really understanding if you want to make drugs that help people and neuropsychiatric disorders, you should understand how the system works. So I did my uh, PhD uh, in neuroscience at UC Davis, um, and that's when I really started to study psychedelics was, was then, in, in 2016. And it was actually a very pivotal time, I think, for the field, because I didn't know if I wanted to study psychedelics. I was afraid that people wouldn't take me seriously as a scientist. Um, but I, the preliminary studies that were out there, it seemed cool. I really liked my advisor and I, and I kind of jumped right in and just kind of held my breath and crossed my fingers. And I'm very glad that I did. I'm glad that I'm here today. Uh, the field of psychedelics has really just exploded and expanded with regards to um, the understanding the possible therapeutics that these, these compounds have. Um, and I'm happy to be here today to discuss all that with you. I'm right now at the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford, um, and we're looking about how uh, these drugs work and how to best implement them for therapeutic use. And we'll end with uh, Dr. Mitchell. Hi, I'm Jennifer Mitchell. I am a neuroscientist and behavioral pharmacologist by training, and I am a professor at UCSF in the departments of neurology and psychiatry. I'm an affiliate with uh, the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics and over at the San Francisco VA, I serve as the Associate Chief of Staff for Research. And uh, I think I've been interested in psychedelics since I was a kid in San Francisco and saw uh, what they could do at the time. Uh, what I saw was mostly negative. And then when I was in college and got to see psychedelics through a different lens, 
Uh, I was intrigued by the the potential that they seem to have therapeutically and was curious about how we could tap into that or how we could sort of steer them in that direction rather than in a negative direction. And I think that's led me to the research that our group has been working uh, to complete over the past seven and a half years or so. Thank you. Um, and so on the topic of psychedelics and how um, the field has exploded and the understanding for possible therapeutic uses and uh, as a field that um, is touching everything in our society, as Jane has said, from our medical systems to our legal systems um, and even our belief systems. Um, I think a, like a few definitions uh, may be helpful to ground us <laughs> in this widespread field. Um, and so I think I'll uh, ask Lindsay, uh, what exactly are psychedelics? Yeah, well, that's actually a more complicated question um, than you might think. Um, so psychedelics, the word psychedelic means mind manifesting. So this idea of kind of yeah, manifesting your mind uh, and and seeing things, and and typically the the definition that I like the most is that they are historically defined things like um, ayahuasca or LSD or psilocybin. These these are to me these are the core of what psychedelics are, and they're sometimes referred to as classic psychedelics. Um, but really, it can kind of like expand to to what other people think as well. So some people say that it is a serotonin to a agonist. Um, and some people just say that it it gives different perceptions of the world, right? So some people may even consider MDMA or ketamine or even marijuana to be psychedelics as well. Um, yeah. Uh, and what I mean, sorry, by a, a serotonin to a agonist, I'll talk about serotonin uh, a little bit later, but uh, serotonin is a molecule in your brain and serotonin 2A is the receptor that binds that molecule. And so uh, psychedelics actually bind this receptor as well. Um, and so when they bind that receptor and maybe act a little bit like serotonin, that's called an agonist. So some people say that if a drug just binds this serotonin receptor, it's referred to as a psychedelic. So, so there, there's multiple definitions. I would say the classic psychedelics. Um, are things like uh, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and ayahuasca, uh, but but it can mean more than that in, in a bit of a broader category. And the other panelists might want to chime in if you if you have any opinions on that. I feel like it is actually a somewhat controversial question. I agree with the mind manifesting bit, and I think that for for my personal perspective, since that's the sort of uh, storied and historic definition, that's the one that I typically lean to rather than the specific the like the specificity on a binding level. <laughs> uh, thank you both. Um, uh, and so thank you both for clarifying with that definition, although it, uh, it may be more complicated uh, than the question would uh, lead one to believe. Um, going further, I think um, we'll go to you, Jane. Um, especially with the expansion of uh, psychedelic uh, knowledge, especially in uh, uh, more of the public, publicly known knowledge, um, which psychedelics are currently under consideration for more public usage? So the one that might be closest to actual general public consumption is MDMA. Um, some people might know that as Molly or ecstasy back in the, the 90s, if you were part of the party scene at all. Um, but MDMA um, is actually under consideration by the FDA for approval as a drug. Um, and it was just announced, I think last week, um, that Lycos Therapeutics um, biotech company, um, which spun out of the nonprofit MAPS, um, they submitted their um, new drug application for MDMA after a series of clinical trials. Um, the FDA announced that they are actually giving it priority review, which means that we might have an answer as to whether or not it's approved as a drug by, I believe, August 11th of this year, which is very soon. Um, if it is approved as a drug, there are all sorts of things that will happen um, that might determine you know, how it can be used. But 
that is kind of um, the drug that is on the quickest track to being widely available. And there are also a lot of clinical trials um, that are close to potentially um, submission for psilocybin. Um, which is the um, active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Um, and those are, I believe, in phase three clinical trials right now. So people are kind of speculating that in the next few years, um, there might be a company that might submit um, a new drug application for that as well. And then, of course, you know, there's research on all sorts of um, psychedelics, which I'm sure that Lindsay and Jennifer can talk more about as well. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, where's my question? Oh, so you actually, Jane, uh, you jumped ahead to my next question. And I was wondering what could sort of opening the legality of MDMA mean for other psychedelics? And you mentioned that um, psilocybin is also being um, uh, researched for possible therapeutic use. Um, are there any others, either from uh, Lindsay or Jennifer? There's LSD for dad. So generalized anxiety disorder, which is a huge disorder in the United States in particular, uh, those data, now the phase two data are complete. And my understanding is that that company is going to forge forward with phase three later this year. And so you mentioned uh, LSD possibly for use in depression. What would um, psilocy psilocybin and MDMA be used for? Is that to any one of us in particular? You know what? Let's just go to you since you're already <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> okay, but I, I was the one that unmuted. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think that originally some of these um, compounds, the, the companies in the space were looking for indications that might allow them to couple, to partner with the FDA. So they were in territory that perhaps there were no good therapeutics to address. So MDMA for PTSD, for example, we don't have great therapeutics for PTSD. We only have these two FDA approved SSRIs, uh, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So antidepressants is what we currently use typically to treat PTSD. So that meant that I think the FDA was willing to partner with this particular sponsor to discuss the possibility of developing a therapeutic for, for PTSD. Similarly, uh, major depressive disorder, treatment-resistant depression. These are um, depressive disorders that don't have great therapeutic uh, response. And so, again, companies sort of moved into that space to develop psilocybin. I'd say the same thing for generalized anxiety disorder, but for benzodiazepines, which are a class of drug that are uh, highly addictive and uh, or habit-forming, let's say, uh, I, there aren't good therapeutics. So I think that's one of the reasons that these indications were first chosen. But the the hope is that there's a lot of uh, signal for different mental health indications for a variety of different psychedelics. And so now that maybe somebody's foot is in the door, perhaps there will be a lot of additional clinical trials in the near future to test a number of different compounds in a number of different disorders. Thank you. Um, and so now that we are sort of getting our minds around what is uh, what therapeutics or psychedelic therapeutics are sort of on the line for possible uh, usage and what it could take, what it could help us get in the future, um, I do wonder um, what could be a couple of roadblocks um, to getting uh, psychedelic assisted therapies, uh, you know, from from the sponsor and the clinical trials to the people who would possibly need those therapies. Um, and I think we will start with um, Lindsay. Hi, uh, yeah, well, so there's um, some different uh, aspects to consider. And I think some of the first ones are both um, the legality and as well as the, um, like how how would it be paid for? I think one current, uh, I want to say, yeah, roadblock or 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 speed bump that I kind of anticipate seeing is like the legality of it, but also paying for it. And so currently, how these stand is that these therapeutics are pretty expensive, and so getting insurance companies or something on board um, to be able to help uh, manage this kind of uh, Pay, just payment, just 
accessibility of this, this kind of treatment, um, I think will be something that needs to be worked out and whether that works out. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how it would be done, whether it's a state level or a federal level. And honestly, Jenny might be able to speak to this more than, than I can. Um, do you want to chime in, Jenny? Sure. I mean, you're absolutely right, right? So this is a big issue and, and one that some of the sponsors have tried to address by discussing with uh, major insurance providers, as well as state and federal facilities to determine, for example, if there could be a code for reimbursement that could be used for a facilitator that spends time with a participant during a, a drug administration session. Those are typically longer than what insurance providers often cover. And so if you're used to paying or reimbursing for a 50 minutes session, and now you're reimbursing for an eight hour session, obviously there have to be some discussions about the, the pay rate for those. So I think that's one limiting factor. And as Lindsay also mentioned, right, there's this legality issue. And so even if, if FDA says on August 11th, yay, MDMA, then the DEA has to step in and reschedule that compound. That's going to take a little bit of time. And then the next question is who's going to administer this, this drug? Uh, who's going to decide which facilitators have access to prescribing the compound? Uh, how much access will they have? How many providers do we have? I think the biggest bottleneck, frankly, is just we have a very limited number of providers that have been trained in psychedelic-assisted therapy. And Jane, if you have anything to add, too. Oh, man. All right. So... <laughs> I feel like um, even within the question of, um, I guess, what, I feel like what we're talking about is the medical model, right? So we're talking about a drug gets approved um, by the FDA. And so I um, actually just interviewed uh, an attorney about this the other day, um, that even if, um, you know, say MDMA gets approved, um, and then the FDA has to reschedule that drug, very likely what might happen is something called bifurcated scheduling. Um, which means that only the version of MDMA, which has been put forth by Lycos, will be approved, and that the drug as a whole might not be approved. Um, I, I imagine if a company tries to go forth with a new drug application for psilocybin, it might be the same thing. I mean, we've seen something similar with um, Spravato, which is S-ketamine, um, a version of ketamine, um, where the drug company can charge a lot for it, whereas uh, generic ketamine is much cheaper. Um, so I think the equity and access is definitely one issue. Um, but even aside from that, um, outside of the medical model, we already have kind of, well, there are the grassroots folks who have been using these drugs for a long time um, and who are really calling for decriminalization of these drugs at a state level or, you know, ideally a federal level, but people are really starting at the city and state level. And then we've got states like Oregon and Colorado that have their own um, psilocybin access programs currently that are not exactly a medical model. Um, in fact, Oregon's rules make it so that um, people can't really make medical claims and they don't require um, folks who are seeking psilocybin therapy to have a, a doctor's note, for instance. Uh, just anyone can go um, and access this. Um, but one thing that's been raised about those programs is that um, they are expensive because it, it costs a lot of money to um, have people trained up and spend time with you over the course of, say, an eight hour session. So it'll be really interesting to see how um, this these kind of state by state programs interact with the medical model if the medical model does move forward. Thank you. And Jane, you mentioned um, the grassroots folks. Um, are do you have any information or do you know if sort of the researchers or pharmaceutical companies are taking any advice um, from these communities, either indigenous or just other cultural psychedelic uh, practitioners? I know some companies are definitely trying. Um, I know some have um, tried to set aside a portion of funds or um, to commit to involving Indigenous voices with their decision making. But I think it's tough, right? I mean, the, the thing with a grassroots movement is that it's often um, not professionally organized. These are these are folks who are coming together with shared interests um, and might not have any background in legislation or business. Um, but I think that there are definitely conversations happening in the psychedelics world about how all these folks with different interests and different backgrounds can work together. Um, but, you know, it's it's slow moving as, as things in the world often are. 
And so assuming uh, MDMA does become federally approved uh, later this year, um, I'm also assuming that there will be probably some open questions for you know the the further research world. Um, I think a big one would be how would we standardize like a methodology for any future uh, research or clinical trials on this. Um, I think oh, I muted myself. Go to Lindsay first. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to to respond to this. Again, I kind of think that Jenny might be the person to to talk about this just because this is like what she does. Um, but I, I think basically the way things are being done is like we have a model and it works and we're kind of trying to make that a standard going forward. Um, there may be alternative models that also work, for example, more dosing sessions or fewer dosing sessions or um, different kinds of therapies that are provided or even things like uh, like the music or the context that's involved. So basically, um, there, there could be ways for the way that clinical trials are run to kind of advance and, and try other avenues. But I think the way things are currently going to be done, and Jenny, I'm sorry, I'm going to pass this to you again in a second, because I think that you are really the person to answer this. Um, I, I think we have a model that kind of works as is like a lot of these initial clinical trials especially with mdma have shown um like therapeutic properties therapeutic potential and i think that that's really important and we may be able to further optimize it going forward but just having something like anything that works to treat something as devastating as ptsd i think it should absolutely be brought forward in a model that works and we can kind of you know help refine it later maybe according to patients needs um but so right now, um, I think I think the the current model is uh, some some preparatory sessions, three different dosing sessions with integration sessions in between. Um, yeah, does that sound right? That was very well done. Yeah. Um, I may I add to what Lindsay just said? Is that okay? Okay. So I think that um, that, that there are two different questions here. One is how to roll out the and how to implement the treatment as it's been developed by Lycos Therapeutics. And I do think that we should implement as it's been developed, at least to start, because we don't yet know what the side effects will be of MDMA-assisted therapy out in the wild. In a clinical trial, everything's really well controlled and you get to screen your participants really well and you get to rule them out for all sorts of different reasons. And when a drug is FDA approved, you don't have those luxuries. So the treatment population becomes very broad and very uh, diverse very quickly. And of course, the new things come up that perhaps you didn't anticipate. And so it would be very hard, I think, for us to know why the side effects that we were seeing were prevalent post-approval if we weren't using the protocol as it's been developed, right? If everyone was sort of off-roading it and saying, I think this would be better in these circumstances, I think it would be better in a group, I think it would be better if I paired it with my own therapeutic modality, and then you get these side effects and we're trying to collect them and we're trying to determine safety and efficacy, it's going to be kind of dirty, right? It's going to be a hot mess, frankly. And so my hope is that they actually keep to the plan and that we continue to acquire data post-approval. That would be called phase four data. That's what the FDA likes to call it. Um, the sponsor might have to come up with a risk mitigation strategy. Then data would be collected that way post-approval. But then to Lindsay's point, then you absolutely want to know how do we better this therapeutic modality? How do we improve access? How do we improve equity? And to do that, we might have to whittle down the costs a bit too, right? So how do we do that? Would it be a group setting? Would it be community care? Would you do these, uh, as Lindsay again mentioned, you have these sort of preparatory sessions and then you have the, the medication and then you have these integration sessions. Perhaps some of those sessions would be better in a group. Uh, you'd have a cohort to be with and it could decrease the cost substantially. Uh, perhaps there are certain therapeutic modalities that have yet to be thoroughly tested with psychedelics uh, that might be better and might allow for, for deeper growth or deeper change. And so we should test all of those as well. I think that's actually an open question right now, right? Like what are the therapeutic modalities that work? And I think this is actually something that's really interesting about this potential MDMA approval is that the FDA doesn't regulate therapy. And this is going to be maybe the first time that they have to rule on this because I mean the what's up for approval is not just MDMA as a drug but MDA eh, eh, MDMA assisted therapy 
Um, and of course, Lycos has developed um, a, a therapeutic um, kind of methodology. Um, and like Lindsay and Jennifer say, like it kind of makes sense to maybe just go with what is established. And um, of course, that's going to be what's approved. So that's what's going to be tested at first um, in, in the real world and see how it works. Um, but I think it's just going to be a, a tough thing to standardize in any way, right? Um, with other drugs, often you just give people the drug and you you look at the outcomes, um, but there's a little bit of, of squishiness there that I think is interesting. Um, and that is going to be really ripe for study um, as it becomes more widely available. And what's sort of interesting about having one sponsor in the field sort of control the drug, at least for a particular period of time, is that they can therefore be the ones that control who the drug is disseminated through, right? So they can say, yes, these, these people get to prescribe and no, these people do not. So that would be one way of regulating the therapeutic model. Uh, the FDA, as Jane said, will not wade into the therapy pool. That's not something that they typically do. And I don't think they would like to do that now. Uh, but certainly they have in the past sort of put um, sort of boundaries on who can prescribe a drug or how frequently they can prescribe a drug, how many people they can have in their prescription pool at any one time. And that ensures that perhaps uh, a, a therapist, a licensed facilitator is not trying to run hundreds of these sessions a month. They're being more thoughtful about their plan. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Mitchell, you mentioned um, uh, that the, well, all of you mentioned the FDA uh, is not really into regulating therapy. Um, is that, would that likely be the responsibility of uh, the sponsor or uh, sort of the states or even maybe licensing bodies like the APA? That's my hope is that the states step in and get involved because otherwise it's going to become very complicated, I think, very quickly. And in order to determine like which facilitator sort of meet the criteria of being allowed access to the drug, I think that uh, the sponsors are probably going to need some assistance in that arena. And so from, from my perspective, sitting in California, we don't yet have a, a process for regulated access to psychedelics, but my hope is that we introduce one shortly. That process itself then could involve some aspect of the therapist training, which is otherwise going to be incredibly expensive for some of these drug companies to take on themselves. And unfortunately, if they do take on the cost of the therapist training, that means they'll probably roll that cost of the drug. And that's not what we want to see, again, for equity and access. That could be a, a showstopper, Right. So my hope is that the costs of the drug remain low. Uh, and to do that, there's going to have to be other trainers in this space. And obviously, a, a great way to do that would be on a state level. And then the state could license those uh, providers. And Lindsay, sorry. No, no, no. I was oh. just going to jump in when you were done. So yeah, please no, go for it. I was just going to say, I, and I think what's really interesting about uh, psychedelic therapy is just that it tends to be pretty different from general psychiatry that licensed psychiatrists um, can administer, I guess. Um, and so I, I don't think it's safe to say that, you know, just if, if you're a licensed psychiatrist, you'll make a good um, uh, facilitator for these sessions. And so I, again, something like if the APA advise, like approves it or not or something, um, uh, I think there needs to be some kind of different training scheme that is n not necessarily distinct, but at least complementary to uh, psychiatry training. Like it, it, it would be different than just it. What I'm trying to say is that you can't have like a drug and like a psychiatrist and a psychiatrist training be your only training that you get. I think you need kind of a more specialized training to do these psychedelic therapies. Um, and that's why kind of these pipelines that Jenny was just talking about are kind of so important because there does need to be really kind of like a specific type of training that's needed. It's not just like any psychiatry training will do. To, to sort of piggyback on Lindsay's point, I think some of the best uh, psychedelic facilitators that we saw, it, it, from my personal perspective in our group uh, for phase three, uh, were not from a psychiatric background. And so I think that that's sort of, there's untapped potential there. Uh, again, I don't know how you'd regulate this on a state level necessarily, but that uh, groups like nurse practitioners, MFTs, LCSWs, there, there are all these different um, providers that I think are particularly adept at 
holding someone through uh, really dark moments and uh, really destabilizing moments and that they could offer tremendous support as psychedelic facilitators. So yeah, in Oregon and Colorado right now, I guess mostly Oregon, since that's the program that's up and running, um, facilitators have to go through a specific set of training. Um, a lot of them also um, have been trying to get, you know, real world experience in doing this. Um, but often a lot of these folks who are now going through training are actually folks who've been working in the underground for decades. And those folks have a wealth of knowledge. And so there's been a kind of an open question of, you know, like what, what credentials are necessary for folks? Um, what feels like, basically what is the line between safety and overkill <laughs> it, that, that kind of um, eliminates people's ability to actually do this work, um, given that these training programs are expensive and that also licensing can be expensive. So that'll be an interesting thing to see through the medical model, um, I know that there's some speculation that um, maybe they'll require folks to have um, a background in formal medicine. And I'm sure that there are many folks um, in the psychedelics um, field who will have opinions about that. But I'll also say that um, beyond kind of the state model um, of regulating therapy um, and the existing state model in Oregon for um, regulating facilitators, um, there are also industry-wide groups that are groups of practitioners and therapists who are trying to think through how to self-regulate, like what is reasonable for us as a group with diverse interests um, to, to recommend, because this is you know uncharted ground. And I think that looking to the people who have actually done the work to think through what might be appropriate um, seems like a good place to start. And then to, sorry. Lindsay, you want to say something first? Yeah, you go first and then I'll go after. I was going to say to, to Jane's point too, then how do you keep the underground from competing with these other sort of above ground interests, right? Because if it turns out that some of this training is particularly expensive or the licensing is particularly expensive, you could imagine that there are a lot of providers that are going to stay in the underground where they've been very successful and very happy for any number of years. And so how would we incorporate them into whatever state system, for example, we might try to stand up? And I'm not really sure. I could imagine one way would be something like... Um, insurance, right? Because sometimes uh, not everything goes as planned. And I think a lot of practitioners might feel more comforted knowing that they had a state insurance system that was underwriting them and that that would be given in exchange for them completing some sort of a state program on uh, training. I just wanted to add that I think uh, our current model for uh, psychedelic assisted therapy is really kind of being led by MDMA. Um, and and the clinical trials that have been done in in MDMA for PTSD, and I think that they've been very successful. But it may come to light that like a little further down the road, different types of uh, psychedelics require different types of training, just even based on uh, you know what other receptors they hit, what are the dangers, or what ways might your mind go. So I think right now. You know, MDMA has been very successful, and I think a lot of people are just kind of using that as a guideline for psychedelic therapy in general. But I think down the line, there, there, there may be something at some point in which different drugs require different trainings. And I think that even from the patient or client perspective, different people want different things. You know, like sometimes when I tell people what I write about for work, they're like, man, I cannot imagine trying to be watched while I am having a psychedelic trip. Like that sounds unpleasant to me. And then other people are like, you know that, I feel like if there were a model in which I was supervised, I would feel a lot more comfortable. And I think it just is really uh, up to the individual too, a little bit, like what, what makes sense for them. But again, you know, there's this delicate balance between safety and, um, you know, preference and um, all of these things are are hard to, to square. I think you're also raising a very good point about the type of facilitation too, and whether or not there'd be a facilitator there just for to hold safety versus a facilitator there to sort of help someone psychologically unpack the process and whatever it is that's coming up from the medicine, right? And I, I think that that's also like... I, Maybe some of you went to the FDA meeting a couple of weeks ago, but this sort of came up in one of the conversations too, that for the uh, 
the GAD LSD trial for the phase two, for those doses, those doses were large enough that as you, as Jane just mentioned, I think people felt uncomfortable having a facilitator sort of up against them and in their face while they were undertaking that that journey, but I think felt otherwise very comfortable and um, well held to have a safety watcher sitting in the room close by. Um, I, I, I think that is just my thing. Um, that um, especially with the different types of facilitation, um, that the sort of the above ground um, psychedelics people would uh, take a lot of at least information or appreciate the experience that those in the underground would have with this kind of facilitation, um, especially since I can only assume that they would probably have more experience than the like, five months between now and August uh, can provide, assuming that MDMA, MDMA is approved and um, these therapies are ready to go. I mean, to be clear, I think a lot of our best teachers right now are underground providers or were underground providers. And and I think some of them were incredible to sacrifice their underground uh, presence during, at least during like MDMA for AT, uh, AT for PTSD phase three to join that group and offer training and supervision above ground, acknowledging that they couldn't really do both simultaneously. But obviously, I think in many of these training programs that are uh, very popular right now, the the teachers, the teaching staff uh, are individuals that have served in the underground for many years. And so they have seen any number of substances in any number of, of patient populations and have a lot of wisdom to share with the rest of us. And on the same topic of sort of these facilitators, you guys mentioned um, uh, people maybe seem uncomfortable with someone just sort of watching them uh, while they are going on their 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 journey. Um, Lindsay, in uh, some conversations that we had before this, um, you had mentioned um, possibly non-hallucinogenic psychedelics. Um, is there, where, did, where would those fit into this conversation on psychedelic assisted therapies? Yeah, so this is exactly kind of what I was trying to do with my PhD is Psychedelic therapies seem to be really efficacious, um, at least so far in the trials that have come out. Um, and I think one major hurdle is accessibility. They're very, uh, it, it's just, it's an expensive treatment. It's time away from work. If you have children that need childcare, it's also like ex more expenses, you know, transportation to or from these facilities. And quite honestly, the people that need these medicines more than anyone are from lower socioeconomic classes. And so there's this kind of dichotomy between the people who need it and how much it costs that you can't, you can't accessibly get this medication. So um, kind of what, what I did in my PhD, and now there's been kind of a lot more work on this as well, is the development of non-hallucinogenic analogs. So if you could, in theory, develop a therapeutic in which you don't need like to be watched by a minimum of two medical professionals in a facility for eight hours, could you achieve a therapeutic response um, by just taking it in the morning and going to work as your normal day? Now, a lot of people, this is a very controversial topic, right? Because a lot of people think that the trip or the journey that you go through is necessary. And there may still be um, kind of like a, I don't want to say a, a somewhat altered state of consciousness with these uh, non hallucinogenic analogs. So if you test them in uh, animal models, what you generally find is that they do seem to have these rapid acting antidepressant effects. Now, if that happens in humans has yet to be seen, the clinical trials are kind of slowly rolling out and starting. Um, and it may be true that this this trip or this journey is really necessary for, you know, maybe it makes the therapeutic response stronger or it lasts longer or something like that. And maybe they won't work in humans. I don't know. But what my point is, is that I think it's a very, uh, I think it's something that the scientific community needs to figure out because if it works, if it does actually work, 
then we can kind of help uh, people have access to this medication. And um, I think that there's also the potential for these non-hallucinogenic analogs to kind of maybe to a point be coupled with therapy. I think that this is, I think therapy will always help, you know, whether you're on drugs, whether you're on non-hallucinogenic analogs, whether you're with psychedelic compounds, I think the therapy will always kind of help you uh, through that. Um, and so you could, you could use it with therapy. You could not use it with therapy. I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is that there's, there's alternatives out there that are trying to be explored. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and so with all of these sort of aspects of um, getting the facilitators um, who are capable of helping uh, administer these therapies, making sure that these therapies are accessible and equitable, especially for those populations that probably need it the most, um, are there any uh, are there, is there anything that probably policy leaders should know about this? Because I, I am, again, assumption uh, that with um, uh, new like FDA approvals means new uh, new discussions on how to fit these uh, therapies within um, the laws, again, federal and statewide. And uh, that question, um, I see, uh, Dr. Mitchell nodding, so we'll start with you, and then we'll just go, uh, uh, Jane, Lindsay, whoever chimes in. <laughs> I think one of the things I was just going to jump in and mention is that we do have these federal access programs for, for novel therapeutics, and in general, when I sort of think of how quickly the federal government can move, I think it's, you know, it's sort of uh, snail's paced, but what we saw during COVID was something very different, right? We had vaccines in a year's time. And that was pretty amazing and fantastic. And, and, and an example of what I think our federal government can do uh, to generate a, an, a drug access program and disseminate it very broadly. So I think that that would be, you know, something to consider for lawmakers and policymakers at this juncture. And then also, uh, to, to Jane's point earlier, I think we really do need to think about how to stand up systems that are truly equitable, because I think that that's a huge hurdle that we might have to overcome uh, and as Lindsay was saying, the people that need the drug the most are those that are most likely to be disenfranchised from uh, like a, a very uh, tightly held, very expensive uh, system, if that's all that we have to offer come August 11th. So my hope is that between now and August 11th, a lot of states are really recognizing that now is the time. I think that a lot of people were also sort of under the under the impression that Oh, FDA would kick the can and maybe in another couple of years we would all have to discuss how to do this and priority review means that uh, August is is perhaps a real deadline and we should all be thinking about how to make this happen in the next six months. Such a big question. <laughs> um, you know, so I write a twice weekly newsletter called the microdose that covers news um, psychedelics news. And as part of that, I've been following state by state legislation very closely because that seems to be where a lot of things are happening. And each time I sit through one of those hearings about a potential bill, or sometimes, you know, states even have exploratory meetings where they just invite people with expertise about psychedelics to come in and talk about them. Um, I'm struck by the fact that our policymakers and legislators have so much on their plates, and most of them know next to nothing about these drugs and the history of them and the progress of the research. Like, it feels like every time I watch one of these hearings, we are starting from like step one, step zero, <laughs> um, and really just trying to get people up to speed about what's been happening. Um, and like Jennifer said, we're going to have to deal with this in the next six months. So it's going to be interesting to see um, what happens. But one thing that I feel like uh, folks are not talking about as much is the fact that if um, MDMA is rescheduled federally, that doesn't mean that states automatically will reschedule those drugs. Um, many states, about half of them, um, will have to take other measures, whether that's going through their state legislators or and making them come to a vote, which might be a, a whole thing, especially if they're not in legislative session in the summer, um, and or having the relevant um, authorities, like you know maybe like a health service of, of the state, 
um, make a ruling on whether to reschedule the drug itself. So I think that's going to be something that will become relevant very quickly um, and that I would wager not many policymakers are thinking about at this moment, given the wide variety of other things they, they are probably thinking about. I, I think these women totally got it. Um, the only thing I, I want to add is that for policymakers that don't have this time, I think that there's there's two kind of uh, pulls in opposite directions. One is like this stigma associated with illicit drugs. And then the other side of the pendulum is this psychedelic hype that people are so excited about it and it can cure everything. Um, and, and I think the only thing that that policymakers really need to focus on is like the data. Like just, just look at it, understand distinct lines of what this can do and what it can't do and, and try to get away from the kind of media sway of either extreme. To add to that, I hope that they're, um, if they do just sort of focus on the data too. So far, one of the things that's sort of been remarkably different about psychedelic assisted therapy is that it seems to have bipartisan support and that sort of makes it different than um, some of the other issues around uh, drug access and and drug use and and scheduling that we've seen previously. And so my hope is that they, as Lindsay said, will continue to look at the data and make decisions based on that. Thank you. Um, and now at this time, we will go to some of the um, questions that were asked uh, from our audience in the Q&A section. Um, if anyone else has any other questions that they would like uh, to ask, please do put them in the Q&A um, so we can get to them while, while we have some time. Um, and so one of our questions is, how much importance is given to psychiatric intervention during all kinds of psychedelic assisted therapies? Um, I think we will uh, start with uh, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, I think it depends on how you define psychiatric intervention, right? So I think one of the interesting things about many forms, maybe not all, of psychedelic therapy that are uh, currently being evaluated in, in clinical trials, at least, is that they are um, much more hands-off and much more interdirected than some of the therapeutic uh, modalities that exist outside of the psychedelics arena. And uh, the idea that many people have is that perhaps you have some sort of inner wisdom or an inner healer or that your own uh, conscious and subconscious mind are the best um, guides to lead you through this process of remembering, for example, a very traumatic event and trying to work it through. And that that's uh, more advantageous than perhaps a more manualized form of psychotherapy. Like one of the examples I always give is like prolonged exposure therapy also works for PTSD, but they're like checklists and you go in and like in this session, we're going to cover these eight things and you have homework and you have to bring the homework back and it's very regimented and it's um, not really as led by the participant. And so many of these um, trials allow the participant to more generally lead the way in their own sort of change. And perhaps that's advantageous. It does mean that from like a psychiatric perspective, there's less of that psychiatric intervention uh, as one is typically accustomed to delivering than, um, than you'd think. And I think that's one of the reasons to the points that others have made that maybe there's room for... Uh, incorporation of individuals from different backgrounds as facilitators that you don't necessarily have to have that sort of psychiatric training uh, to be a really great practitioner in this field. And that perhaps in some in some respects, maybe that training could even get in the way because you're so used to delivering training a certain way, like you just said, like psychiatric interventions, that maybe your mind just goes there in a way that doesn't allow for the participant to lead the way. Thank you. Um, would Lindsay or Jane, if you would want to add into that? Cool. Um, our next question. <laughs> um, let me see. So we do have a question about uh, if there are any types of psychedelic assisted therapies currently covered by insurance today. None are legalized, right? And so until, uh, unfortunately, until a, a modality is legalized, then there really isn't a need for insurance providers to sit down at the table and have those discussions. 
we're in the very early stages of even thinking about that. It seems like I know that some of the medical codes for that would be associated with psychedelic assisted therapy, like have just been approved for use potentially, but yeah, until the drug is actually approved, I don't think we'll see um, any movement on that front. Yeah. I think they're just, they want to make sure it even works before they bother spending the time trying to like figure out how to pay for it or insure it. So I think we're in the, we're seeing if it works phase. The other thing that I've learned that I think um, I've shared with Lindsay in the past is that uh, evidently it it really depends on when it breaks even too financially for insurance providers to decide when to pick it up. Because I guess we change insurance providers in the United States so frequently that uh, a lot of providers don't want to pay for anything that they can't recoup their costs on within four years time because otherwise they sort of paid it forward for the next insurance provider. So the question is, how do you envision uh, current psychedelic sciences um, can best help balance information for people who are in the recreational use space without over sensationalizing or over correcting it. And um, the, some of the context behind this question um, uh, is in regards to uh, the culture around psychedelics um, starting to change um, from more of a rave culture hippie uh, idea to these therapeutic uses. No, thank you. That gave me some more time to process. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we often think about psychedelic science as being kind of focused on the, the drugs themselves and the medical application of them, these clinical trials, which I think, you know, of course, are a hugely important part of psychedelic science. But I also want to point out that um, psychedelic science includes humanities researchers and psychologists and sociologists, like folks who are looking at the culture around the drug too. And I think to that end, um, psychedelic scientists are really trying to dig into some of those cultural attitudes, how they're changing, um, trying to pull the public um, about their attitudes towards these drugs and in what context would they feel comfortable with them um, being regulated or even uh, whether how comfortable people are using them themselves and in what different contexts. Um, and I think also looking into uh, adverse events and um, having this more qualitative research and a little bit of quantitative data, uh, if we can get it, which is sort of difficult at times um, with how some of this work is still happening underground um, or in these state programs that haven't yet um, had a, a data collection system. That's a whole separate thing that we could probably have a whole separate hour long um, webinar about. Um, but a lot of folks are really trying to pull together that information to, to show the full picture of what's going on with psychedelics, which I do think is the only thing that's really going to mitigate that, that hype um, that Lindsay mentioned, right? Like, of course, these drugs can be really powerful and they have helped lots of people. However, that's not a universal experience. And I think it's really important to be clear with people that that's, um, that's the case. So we are coming on our last couple of minutes. Um, my final question to all of our panelists is, uh, what is one thing you would like the audience to take away from this conversation? Um, and I'll give you a couple of seconds to mull that question over. And then whoever has their answer when it speaks to you, go ahead and just speak. I'll say that from my perspective, I think it's just important to remember it's early days. We don't have all the answers. It, you know, this, this field is in its infancy. And my hope is that we sort of baby step our way forward so that we don't sort of have a, a pendulum swing in the other direction and a, a sort of a, a group public panic as we did in the late 60s and early 70s. I, I kind of had very similar thoughts that I'm going to echo now, which is, I think that there does seem to be some promise for this field, and it definitely deserves um, being explored. But I think that there's a lot that we still have to figure out. And, you know, whether, you know, both, both to policymakers, but also to, you know, kind of that last question we were just talking about to like individuals, to people, like really just look at the data for what it is. And I think it's really key right now to not, you know, fall into this hype or over sensationalize it. But also I think we need to get away from the stigma. And so I guess I'm just reiterating, which is um, 
I, I think that there's a lot of promise for this field, but we'll see how it unravels and to be be keep a level head and and look at the data. Yeah, I think kind of hand in hand with what Jennifer and Lindsay both said, I think maybe the thing I would say is just that it's com it's complicated. It is very complicated and that um, you might hear a kind of singular narrative, especially rising out of the ashes of stigma is like psychedelics are amazing. Um, but I found that in my time really talking with people who who work in this field, that there is such a diversity of opinions and perspectives um, that there is really no monolithic way forward. And there are so many different avenues that people are really exploring to try and um, to understand these drugs and um, how, how we use them and how we should allow access to them or, or restrict access to them. So um, it is complicated and it will only get more complicated as time goes on. <laughs> And on that note, I think we will end this conversation. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Um, and thank you all for joining us in this dialogue. We hope you can join us next month um, for our last panel in this series. Next month, uh, we will be having a conversation about brain-computer interfaces. Um, so brain-computer interfaces offer real promise in treating disorders, but they also have created ethical issues with development in clinical populations and insufficient support and follow-up care after trials. On Wednesday, March 27th, uh, we'll have a conversation about these brain-computer inter interfaces, uh, their non-clinical applications, and the convergence with other technologies. Registering for that will be sent to all of our participants shortly. Um, we hope we can all uh, join us there. And again, thank you all for coming. <laughs>